What happens in a small Iowa town when a factory leaves and Jack Dorsey from Twitter comes in? Kurt Wagner from Recode is here to talk about how Snapchat is separating social from media. Nanea Reeves tells us about her product that lets you alter your mood in VR. And Isaac Lean tells us about his new device that he made especially for his grandma. All that and a lot more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, Episode 8, recorded Thursday, November 30th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Grammarly. Download Grammarly, the intelligent writing app, for free by visiting getgrammarly.com slash twit. And by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. I, have, we, I think we, I, well, I will apologize for us because we didn't let you know that like last week we wouldn't have an episode because mm -hmm. it was Thanksgiving here mm -hmm. in the U.S. American Thanksgiving. So Just instead in of thing. recording a show about tech news, we, we didn't record a show about all the food we were eating, mm -mm. But they, which is probably a good thing. But it was all good. Yep. Shall we get to the Let's tech do news it. now? Because I know you've been waiting. So one of the many darker sides of tech, tech is job loss. What happens when automation gets better than humans at work? Lori Siegel, host of the CNN show Mostly Human, took, took a look at one town that lost a factory but gained some new tech that is helping it thrive. Welcome to the show, Lori. Thanks for having me. So tell us what happened after the Electrolux factory closed down in Webster City, Iowa in 2011. Uh, I mean, in short, it was devastating for this small town. Uh, you go in and this was a small town uh, in Iowa where the whole town kind of revolved around this factory, around Electrolux. This is where, uh, if you were a kid, this is where your parents worked. This is where your family worked. This is where you wanted to work. And that that shut down abruptly and, and those jobs went over to Mexico. Um, and it was absolutely devastating for this community. And I think we're seeing this happen all around the country, but when we looked at it through the lens of Webster City, uh, you talk to residents there who I, I gotta say, they have a phrase, Iowa nice, and they were just the nicest people you could meet. And they said at the time, they were just worried that the town was gonna dry up and blow away. And all of these small businesses uh, shut down. Uh, and, and there was one moment that was just devastating where you could kind of look back on it, where their town movie theater closed and people couldn't afford uh, to keep it open and people couldn't afford to go to the movies. And, and that uh, for a lot of people in, in the town was such a landmark moment um, because people were absolutely devastated. And, and I, I will never forget, um, I spoke to a man named Jeff, who he, I think you just saw in, in that clip, who took me to where uh, Electrolux used to be. And he said, when they made the announcement, um, a woman who had just gotten a house and whose whole family and their whole livelihood kind of relied on this factory um, just screamed and almost started pulling her hair out. So you could hear, and I know that's it's such an extreme example, but you could hear the devastation and the pain and how important this com or this this factory was for the livelihood of this town and its future. So I think it was really, really difficult for Webster City when Electrolux shut down. Yeah, there are so many moments like this in, in your piece. I highly recommend people watching it. That that moment where she, you know, this woman who just bought a house pulls her hair out. Yeah. You can feel, you can feel, um, you know, just just what we always th talk about. Oh, robots are stealing all our jobs. You know, you, yeah. we just throw it off. But you know, when you really think about it, it it's it's it, like you said, it's devastating. You have a piece. Uh, you have a, a fact in your piece that by 2032, 38 percent of the jobs in the U.S are at high risk of becoming automated. So, so what, is that, what does that mean exactly, high risk of becoming automated? You know, when I looked at, if you look at through kind of the Webster study and what happened with Electrolux, a lot of these jobs, sure, they're going away, cheaper labor in Mexico, that's what happened to this elect to Electrolux, 
But a lot of those jobs are disappearing. They are going to be replaced uh, by robots. So a lot of these jobs might be going away, but they're, the nature of jobs are changing. We talk about automation all the time, whether it's the future of uh, self-driving cars. I remember when I first got my, uh, my start in tech, it was interviewing founders like Travis, the founder of Uber and the founders of Lyft. They were some of the first people I put on camera. And I'll never forget them saying, you know, this is going to be amazing for workers because this is giving people freedom and people and flexibility and they can build out their own businesses and drive their own cars. And, you know, and now we're looking at an uncertain future, even with the future of driving, right, where, you know, those jobs are likely going to go away in general. So I think there's some hard conversations that we need to have around what that future looks like. And, and I know there's um, you know, there's this dystopian future where uh, robots take over everything. I don't think it has to be that negative of a conversation, but it needs to be a conversation. And uh, and I met with Jack Dorsey, who's the founder of Twitter and Square in Webster City, Iowa. And, you know, and we had we started talking about it because I think it's this moment where we need our tech leaders who are building out the technology that's going to displace people to think about investing in these solutions along with our government and along with us having this kind of national dialogue. Curious to um, to hear your take on, on Jack Dorsey's kind of involvement in the piece. So I will admit it kind of took me by surprise. It was like, oh, well, here here's, here's totally the tech angle, right? Like there's Jack Dorsey. <laughs> we all know who Jack Dorsey is. Why was his presence in this town uh, such an important moment. Like, what did what did that symbolize? Uh, based on you know the the town, they have a, apparently a lot of of the businesses there invested in Square. Oh, it's interesting because I've interviewed Jack throughout the years, and always in San Francisco or New right. York City. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to meet in Webster City, Iowa, of all places. Um, and I thought it was fascinating. And I and I think um, increasingly you see Mark Zuckerberg going into smaller towns. You sense this this feeling of responsibility. These tech founders have, but very specifically, when that the factory shut down, when Electrolux shut down, uh, something interesting started happening with the the small town, and a lot of uh, people went out and started building out their own small businesses. And they were using Square Technology, uh, which is Jack Dorsey's company. He co-founded Twitter, but he also has Square, which allows people to accept mobile payments and uh, pay a, a, in an easier way. And and a lot of these businesses started using Square, which was. Uh, very interesting. So you had, I think, over 40 small businesses popping up using Square. So people, instead of feeling like they had to go, you know, to the factory and, and this was going to define them, started looking at what they wanted to do, what their purpose was, and what kind of businesses they would build out. And so uh, the Square folks heard about it, uh, and they actually came uh, before, and they started shooting a documentary uh, around it. And what was really interesting is the documentary was kind of centered around the movie theater that I told you about, it actually, uh, you see it right there, it actually came back to life. They were able to actually pull together the town and, and get this movie theater up and running, which was a symbol. Uh, and a lot of that uh, was due to people kind of building out these businesses with Square. Now, it's a beautiful story and it's wonderful. I will say there's still so many hard questions because a lot of these people have freedom to build their own businesses and to create kind of the life they wanted to, but they're still working two jobs to make ends meet. And, you know, they don't have health insurance. So uh, Jack, I think this is really personal to him. If you know Jack, he grew up in St. Louis. He brought his parents, by the way, to Webster City, Iowa. You have a multimillionaire founder uh, bringing his parents to Webster City, Iowa and staying in the local motel uh, and really trying to celebrate this town and, and the movie theater. Uh, they were actually airing the documentary that Square shot. So. We all sat down and we said he got to know a lot of the locals and we had a, a real candid conversation about what had happened in that town and what that means for the rest of America. So in your interview, uh, Dorsey told you that he felt like uh, Twitter and to some extent uh, Square had sort of lost touch with the people that they were yeah. serving. Um, and it, and this reminded me of Zuckerberg's world tour, or U.S. tour that he's <laughs> been going on, milking cows and, and whatnot. What do you make of these <laughs> tech CEOs like going to the communities? Um, is it, I mean, and, and being in that community, spending those four days in that community, what did the people there make of, of Jack Dorsey? I mean, by the way, they were so excited. He was kind of like the rock star. People were, you know, walking up and wanting to take pictures with him. Um, look, I, you know, I think we are in this moment in time with technology where we're we're kind of walking this delicate balance of like, 
or this fine line of like, are we living in a utopian world or a dystopian world? And I've known a lot of these founders for many, many years. And something started happening over the last couple of years. And I think that's because we all saw the negative impact of technology and we all started talking about it. Look no further than the US election and what happened with the weaponization of social media. But I think you're beginning to sense that a lot of these founders need to grow up. They need uh, to get out of the Silicon Valley bubble and believe because for so long it was they're changing the world and they're doing all of these incredible things. And there was a certain blindness and there was a certain arrogance to it. And, and I think uh, they've been humbled in, in, a, in quite a few ways over the last couple of years, whether it's Uber or Twitter or Facebook, we've seen uh, a lot of things happen at these platforms um, you know, that we need to kind of take a larger scope. And I think, you know, Jack, it was really interesting to hear him say what I've kind of been sensing a little bit, just having known founders for many years, which is that there was this sense that they're out of touch, that they're building for other people in Silicon Valley. I think, wasn't it like the uh, the breaking point was the juicer? You know, the, the one thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I just think, <laughs> like if I could look at a moment in time in covering technology where there was a moment that like everyone was like, really guys? You know, we have, you have this insane responsibility to do what you came to do, which is change the world and make it a better place. And it's not, we're not there yet. And if we don't focus on it, in a really powerful way and you don't get it together, we're actually gonna go the opposite direction. I don't think that was all cause of Juicero. Like I'm, I'm sure people are gonna hate <laughs> me for saying that. I, I feel bad, that maybe for me was the moment. <laughs> that's that's a great example. My my One of my favorites is the internet connected salt shaker. So that's another brilliant <laughs> idea that needs to needs to exist apparently. Right. Innovation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Innovation in all sorts of ways. Um, what, what I was kind of struck by is this kind of conflict between the fact that technology in many ways is replacing workers um, like those in Webster City and then the technology that's also empowering them on yeah. the other end. How do the residents there grapple with kind of those two opposing forces? I, you know, I think they're really optimistic about technology and they're optimistic about what it can do for them. And I even sat down uh, with a guy named Jerry in that piece, who was just a, a really interesting guy. And I asked him about artificial intelligence in the future. And, and he said, you know, we think about these things every day, but we're not threatened by them. And he said, because there's gonna be someone that has to help the robot. You know, it doesn't mean we're going away. We just have to rethink the way we do things. And I thought that was such, um, you know, especially from someone whose job could easily be replaced and who actually lost his job uh, and he was the union leader there. It was such a, uh, I would say, a forward thinking way to look at it. Um, but, you know, but then you also, and you'll see it at one of the most powerful moments I thought uh, in the piece was, you know, sitting with a young, a, a guy who's like a, a young man. And, and he said, you know, I asked him about artificial intelligence in the future. And he said, well, nothing's gonna, you know, this con this this country wasn't built on microchips, he said. And, and he went on to say that, you know, there's nothing like the spirit of the American worker. Um, and it was, an incredible moment and it was a powerful moment. But for me, having covered tech for all these years and seeing um, and seeing people resist the changes that are coming or say that's not gonna happen, uh, it was a little bit sad because I, I think this is inevitable. This is going to happen. Um, and so what's the best dialogue we can have around it? But so many of the people in the town were really empowered by the technology, were empowered by Square, were empowered by the fact that um, I, this might sound a little kind of lame to say, but I think it was this idea that they were seen um, and that someone even like Jack Dorsey, who who really is in a position of influence, came to the town and, and didn't just come in and out on a plane. You know, he came and he brought his parents um, and he stayed and he was and I, what I like about Jack is he's almost more interested in talking to to the locals of the town than he is, you know, as uh, with the PR flax. I mean, it's something I think that's really personal and it's a very important mission because increasingly these tech leaders have so much responsibility. Lori, thank you so much for joining us. What I highly recommend people watch this episode and, and all the episodes of Mostly Human. What's the easiest way for people to, to watch it? Um, if you have seen and go, if you have Apple TV or Roku, you can actually stream it. Um, and then you can also check out the website we have uh, for Mostly Human. It's just on CNN. Thank you so much, Lori Seagal from Thanks CNN. for having me. Take yeah, care. Thank you. After the break, Snapchat is separating social from media. Will it pay off? But first, 
let's thank our sponsor, Grammarly. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. I found Grammarly about a year ago. Someone wrote in looking for a grammar checker for a high school student, and many of you, our viewers, recommended Grammarly. So I started using it, and right away I realized it's not just great for students, but really for anyone who wants their writing to look polished all the time, whether you're writing a post on Facebook or sending out your resume. If you want to use Grammarly, you can copy and paste any English text into Grammarly's online text editor or install Grammarly's free browser extension for Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. Grammarly scans your text for common and complex grammatical mistakes. Subject verb, verb agreement, modifier placement, comma splice, weak adjectives, missing articles. It doesn't make you make the changes. If you don't like what Grammarly is suggesting, you do not have to accept its changes. That's your right. Grammarly's powerful algorithms are, lo are developed by the world's leading linguists and language lovers. Improve your skills with Grammarly's detailed explanations for all your mistakes and weekly progress reports. Be sure to check out Grammarly's Facebook and Twitter accounts. If you're a total grammar nerd, you can get some fun grammar tips and get involved in some discussions. The Grammarly blog offers daily tips and insights on how to improve your day-to-day -day writing to achieve personal and professional goals. Get started and join more than 10 million happy Grammarly Chrome users today. Download Grammarly now for free at getgrammarly.com slash twit. That's getgrammarly.com slash twit. And we thank Grammarly for their support. So it's been a rough go for Snapchat and its transition from scrappy upstart with monumental growth to a stagnating public company trying to maintain that growth at the very least. The next step for Snapchat is redesigning the app experience, which has some potential upside, no doubt, but also carries with it some risk. Joining us to talk about the new changes is Kurt Wagner from Recode. Welcome back. Hey, what's up, guys? It's great to have you back. So first, yeah. uh, Snap CEO Evan Spiegel uh, first revealed that Snapchat would be changing the interface. I think that was earlier this month. What did he say then, and how was it received by Wall Street and users that these changes were imminent? Yeah, so on the earnings call at the beginning of the month, he was like, hey, we've heard feedback that our app is too hard to use. And so as a result, we're going to you know, implement this redesign and theoretically tackle the problem around ease of use. And, and in my opinion, I was thinking, okay, this is where he kind of makes Snapchat a little bit more mainstream and makes it more popular with um, people who aren't just teenagers, right? Like you don't need to be a mobile first uh, generation in order to use Snap. Then they came out with this redesign. They unveiled it a few days ago. And really it, it was a redesign, right? Like it was, and I know that sounds kind of silly to say, but they are taking aspects of the app. They're moving them to other screens. They're cleaning stuff up. It's like a different font, different styles, but it's not really changing the functionality of the app in the way that at least I, and I think a few other folks who I talked to believe that they might. Um, I don't think it's necessarily making it easier to use, it makes it you know, more visually appealing, perhaps easier to kind of navigate um, or at least maybe explain to an outsider. I don't know if it's necessarily easier to use. So kind of, it, it kind of interesting. I don't know if this really is going to solve their question. Is there anything that stands out uh, to you that kind of reduces, for lack of a better word, the quirky appeal of Snapchat? Because I know, you know, ongoing uh, users, people who use it a lot, like, they, they kind of get the rhythm. They get the language of the app. Anyone coming into it that's that's new to the app, it takes a little while of kind of poking around and trying to figure things out to even understand how you do something as simple as like record a video. Um, are those quirks kind of still in there? Should they go away in your opinion? I think they're still in there. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that is going to be different is, you know, the, this whole thing, Evan Spiegel, CEO, wrote this blog post that was like, hey, um, we're going to separate the personal from kind of the entertainment and the professional. And I think what they're doing there is kind of interesting in the sense that if I'm new to the app and I go in, um, it's very easy to tell what are kind of my private messages versus what are, you know, professionally produced things. I think in the old version, um, there's a lot of that's on the same page and it does create kind of this if you're new, maybe confusion around like what you're actually looking at or how to find stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I think Snap still is going to be kind of this quirky thing where it opens directly into the camera. 
Um, the language that it uses, right, like stories, uh, is not is is the language that's kind of gotten popular because of like Instagram and Facebook copying it. But um, you know, snap streaks, for example, like those are not things that the average person knows. You kind of have to be a, a hardcore Snapchat fan to figure that kind of stuff out. And I think a lot of that still exists. The question again is like, is that going to push them to the next level, or is that just simply going to make it a little bit more appealing to the same group of people they already have? One of the things that Spiegel said in that blog post was that he was doing this, separating the Discover tab, you know, the the performers and media people that you follow from your actual friends. He was doing it so that we wouldn't feel so much that we need to perform for our friends. And I think that, I thought that was interesting because I don't think that will change shit at all. Um, I mean, I think that, that the toothpaste is already out of the tube in that one. Like that's what social media is. We're all performing for our friends. Like I don't think separating um, that that is going to change that. Do you? Well, it's 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 kind of interesting because I never really saw that as being Snap's issue, right? Like I don't not post to Snapchat because I'm afraid that I need to post this amazing photo of a you know a lunch or a, a beach vacation or whatever. Um, I think that's more of an issue that Facebook experiences, not really Snapchat. And actually, when Instagram kind of adopted Stories about a year, year and a, I guess a year and a half ago. Um, one of their big things was like, hey, it's become too hard to post in the Instagram feed because this bar, like this expectation is that you're going to post this amazing photo every time. And and as a result, it turns people away. So um, I actually think that that was already kind of the MO of Snapchat, right? It's disappearing photos. The stories disappear after 24 hours. Um, I wasn't quite as sold on that being a reason for the redesign. I get the I get the argument. I just already thought that that was kind of something Snap did well um, and that kind of differentiated it from Facebook and Instagram. So it was interesting that they that they continue to bring that up. It, clearly, they see that as, a, as an important factor for the app, but I think it's something they've had all along. Yeah, it kind of seems like a, an ongoing challenge with Snapchat, especially at this point now that they're public, is that they want to be seen, they have to be seen now that they're public, in the same playing field as, as some of the social networks like Facebook, like Twitter. But yet the services are, at their core, you know, very different. There's there's a social graph there, but it's not as much of a public social graph on Snapchat as opposed to something like Facebook and Twitter um, and, you know, maybe that, maybe that makes it a lot more difficult for them to achieve the same success as a company like Facebook in the eyes of the public is, is that just an inherent flaw in the business model of Snapchat? And are they going to have to, are they going to have to change that at some point? And that might be disastrous if they do that with their hardcore users. Yeah. I don't know if I would describe it as a flaw, but it was interesting in the, in Evan's blog post where he describes Snap as more of like text messaging and WhatsApp. Yeah. So he is viewing it as a communication platform, which I think is is how I have viewed it for a long time. It's kind of an entertainment platform, too, if you include Discover. But I think it is more messaging focused than it is social networking focused. Um, and the problem is, think of all the messaging services you use. Who's figured out a good business for a messaging app? Uh, mm -hmm. Not really anybody, right? Like WhatsApp is used by 1.2 billion people. I don't think it makes any money at all. Uh, Messenger is trying to get like businesses to talk to you. I don't know if people actually want to talk to businesses on a, on a text message. So I think that it's interesting that this is the approach they want to take and kind of double down on. The, the problem, I suppose, is that we're yet to see, with, you know, a real like big time messaging business in the way that we've seen Facebook turn kind of this social graph into a business. I think Snap is somewhere in the middle of those two, but they're clearly trying to identify more on the messaging side, more on the intimacy side of that. And um, uh, it's just going to be harder because it limits the amount of people that you talk to. It limits the scale and advertising businesses are driven by scale. So I think they're just going to always going to have that as, as a challenge as long as they stick with this approach. I mean, what is their business model? Like what is, I mean, I, I understand that it's advertising based and I understand that, you know, the, um, the, the Snapchat filters that I'm so fond of are, um, you know, they're sponsored <laughs> and they're making a lot of uh, money from that. But I mean, are the direct messages, are there, I mean, I don't use it as a direct message tool enough to know that are there ads within those? No. So, so right now they're putting the ads inside that discover section. So the ads are showing up alongside the professional content and they're also showing up, um, in between or kind of after people watch a story from somebody. So that's not really a direct message. That's kind of like a public message, but to your friends. Mm -hmm. And so they're making money off of that. 
Um, and those right now are kind of like the big ways that, that are the big areas of the app where the company makes money. Um, the question is like, are there other opportunities like where messenger is putting ads, uh, you know, in your inbox, so to speak, um, could snap kind of do something similar. And I, and I don't really know. Uh, I do think that their approach has been, Hey, we are going to have fewer people but they're going to be so engaged and they're going to be from areas of the world where we can really like get a lot of money from advertisers. They're in areas like the United States where there's great connectivity, where there's big businesses, where there's a lot of advertising and marketing dollars to be spent. We're going to capitalize on those areas and that's how we're going to grow our business. We're not going to do what Facebook is necessarily doing, which is reach as many people as humanly possible. We're going to reach uh, fewer people, but we're going to do a better job of reaching those people either more consistently or with higher performing ads. And the question is like, they haven't done that yet. Can they do that? It's a, it's an interesting concept. It makes sense on paper, but actually acting it out and, and, and capitalizing on it is a lot harder. I think what they need to do is they need to uh, create some hardware, maybe a pair of glasses that you record video. <laughs> right. Great idea. Yeah. And, That's a, and maybe sell them at like, not like at a store where yeah. you would normally buy things. Make but it like, really hard to buy them. Yeah. Like put it in the middle of the desert in yeah. like a vending machine or something like that. See? I think that would be a good business. We need to work for Snap, obviously. <laughs> Kurt Wagner with Recode. Always appreciate your time. Thank you for taking time to talk with us today. Where can people follow all your work online? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm at Rico.net along with all my colleagues, and then I'm on Twitter at Kurt Wagner 8 Awesome. Thanks again, Kurt. We'll talk to you all soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. See ya. Up next, if you want to get high on VR, yes, you heard that right. We have a story for you. But first, uh, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system that's designed for entrepreneurs. Maybe that's you. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware purchase. With their iOS and Android app, callers can actually reach you wherever you happen to be on your mobile phone that you already own. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand, kind of keep them siloed, but on the same device. Uh, when you make a call, your client will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. You simply select a toll-free or a local number. You can record a custom greeting, add multiple extensions for your business. And, you know, as you know, toll-free numbers are, are great for marketing. It makes your business sound more professional, makes it sound more legitimate. Uh, set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can also get your voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments, if that's easier. Uh, you can send and receive SMS text messages from your business number on your device as well. So it covers the whole scale. Uh, join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 per month and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper for their support of Tech News Weekly. VR is at a bit of a crossroads. Is it a fad or is it the future? What will we use it for? One veteran from the video game industry thinks she knows one of the answers. Nania Reeves is the CEO of Trip, a mood altering VR platform. Welcome to the show. Hi, hi. So How are you guys? I thanks for having me. It's <laughs> thanks actually Nanea. Nanea. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I know, and you have it pronounced on your or your Twitter feed and everything. Yeah, Nanea. Phonetically. <laughs> uh, so okay. Trip comes out next year, 2018. It's been yeah. described as a combination of audio and visual elements, gameplay mechanics, and meditation. Tell us what it is exactly. That's a good question. <laughs> um, we're finding as we've begun development that the product itself is kind of telling us what it wants to be as well. But um, what we're focused on at Trip is creating transformative experiences that are digitally delivered. And our first experience is, is specifically a VR native product that is focused on changing the way that a person feels. So when you trip, you'll be able to select different feelings that might help you chill out after a long day at work or um, calm down even before an on-camera interview like this <laughs> and conversely pump you up before a workout or some other activity that you might want to be primed and amped for. We're targeting those opposite ends of the spectrum 
to um, uh, build out the platform. And then ultimately, we'll start to do variations on that theme and create different trip experiences that we hope will help people live more effectively and and potentially even feel more happy, you know, feel happier. Um, we are doing this, as you mentioned, Megan, by taking visual, visual and audio elements that have been known to produce certain effects when a person is exposed to them. And then uh, the meditative experience, we use that word um, for lack of a better term because we're really trying to approach um, how to trigger a mindful state through an experiential interface. Obviously, we're not going to have you come into our app and tell you to listen to a, an audio file and close your eyes, you know? So how do we trigger calm through exposure to certain sound frequencies and and um, visual experiences that people will respond to? But our secret sauce is because we are from the game industry is that we are using gameplay me mechanics to also um, target certain reactions from the user. Um, as game designers, we've been doing that for a long time. We've just uh, produced those effects as a secondary byproduct of um, uh, development or a product that's focused on a, a narrative experience uh, or a, a, the game or the rules of gameplay. What we're doing at Trip is turning that paradigm around and we're going right for the mood or the feeling and then using the mechanics to deliver that. I love the transformative qualities of VR when you can put in put on you know any of the really cool VR experiences that I've had yeah. you you forget you forget about the now and you're able to transport yourself to it another place whether you know whether it be to the to the level that you're talking about with trip or whether it yeah. be just you know going to a different land one thing that I've heard about in the past and I'm sure I'm assuming this is one of the components of this of the of your approach is binaural beats something yep. called iDoser which is you can yeah, you can yeah, look up online yeah. and how does this compare to that obviously there's the added visual perspective sure. but how do those two sensations those two the, the auditory and the visual yeah. kind of combine to create something unique well sound is definitely a big part of our experience as well as music um, we are creating an adaptive music interface um uh, we have an exciting announcement that we're going to make um, uh, soon on uh, a key hire for our company to direct us on our sound architecture. Um, you know, when you combine it with the immersion of VR, not just the visuals, so you've got that sound, you know, as you mentioned, binaural beats, isochronic tones, as well as we know music in and of itself can um, provoke certain emotional reactions. And then you add the visuals, as you mentioned, and put that with the immersion of VR. The VR becomes the multiplier effect, right? And that's actually how we be, uh, came upon our our name of calling ourselves Trip because every time I saw anybody do a VR experience when they took it off, it didn't matter how old they were, where they were from, they just said, wow, that was a trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and so uh, we, we started calling ourselves Trip even before we knew that this was where we wanted to focus our attention. Zach and I, um, I was actually an early investor in Oculus through my friendship with Brendan, um, the CEO, former CEO of Oculus. And um, uh, we had tried an early demo of it and Zach came with me, my partner, Zach Norman. And uh, we said, let's make a game. And we made this fun solitaire game app because every new platform needs a good solitaire game mm -hmm. and um, did it in a haunted house that you can turn around in and we had this cool experience of what you know you had mentioned of being taken away from our lives to another place and um, but even more interesting to us was the fact that when we re-emerged we into our real lives we felt refreshed and that's what caused us to kind of lean into this idea of how can we create this ability to retreat um, in a way and um, kind of do a reset on um, your emotional state, your mood, your state of mind, and then get you back into the flow of life with maybe a new perspective. Nice. 
So there's there's obviously a dark side of um, yep. of drugs and um, yeah. and video game addiction. We've all heard about yes. it. Um, yep. You know, social media addiction and you know any kind of thing that changes your mood. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on that. Well, you know that that is a. a great topic for discussion. It's something we've talked about internally as well as with our investors. Um, we do have a motto as a company that we want to do no harm. And so we are um, working with, uh, a, we're, we're right now in the process of finalizing a lab partnership um, to ensure that at minimum before we go to market that our product, um, uh, we know exactly what's happening, not only, you know, just in general, but even do specific tests on younger minds as well as uh, as well as older. So um, we want to make sure that we're getting something out in the market that's beneficial first and foremost, um, uh, whether that can be measured or not, but it, at least we want to make sure we're not doing anything um, wrong. For, as far as addiction, um, it is our goal to design a product that makes you want to do it again. Um, uh, we will be able to identify patterns of abuse since we're delivering the experience from the server. We could potentially um, uh, look at patterns of um, over usage and, and uh, restrict access, et cetera. These are unknowns to us. Um, so really our, our first go to market plan is to make sure it's well tested and that we start off with a beta community um, that uh, um, can provide feedback to us before we go out more broadly. I'm guessing you won't have a hard time finding beta testers for something. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that's definitely, I, I haven't met anybody who doesn't want to try to. But, uh, I do think that for, as a development focus, we have to make sure we build something that is um, positive, beneficial, makes you want to do it again. That's really right. important to us because VR is still very much a novelty use case, it right? Really is, you yes. know, that's the element elephant in the room that no one's talking about. Uh, you you go, wow, that was trippy. That was great. And then you never go back to it. Right. And yeah. What is the what is the uh, the percentage of people that, that actually return to it and, and uh, you know, make it a part of their regular, you know, yep. regular daily lives and go back to it? What are the what are the technical requirements for something like this? Like there are different levels of VR. Is yep. this the kind of thing that would require room tracking in order to really no. make it immersive? Or is it a sit down like daydream? Uh, sort of it, experience. It's a sit down experience. We are um, normalizing the controller to um, eye tracking and head movement mm, okay. so that you don't have to, um, uh, we don't have to um, have specific inputs, you know, from one platform to the other. We see mobile as being um, a big opportunity for us. So, um, you know, we're w very well versed in deploying uh, hardened software applications across multiple devices. You know, Zach Norman, my partner, and I were of the founding team of a, a one of the first big mobile game companies called Jamdat. And uh, Jamdat went public in 2005, and then we were um, bought by two uh, in 2006 by Electronic Arts. And we built a really solid business on feature phones, <laughs> believe it or not, even before the smartphone um, uh, video uh, mobile games. Um, so there's, you know, we don't, we've learned through that process, you can't code to lowest common denominator and just port that across all devices. Um, but we, we are, mobile is not an afterthought for us. It's a primary focus. <laughs> So uh, you just recently announced four million in Series A yep. funding. Congratulations! Thank you, Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> so Katrina Lake from Stitch Fix uh, is just recently brought her company public, and she was the only yep. woman this year to to bring a company public. Yeah. Um, what has been your What have been the challenges as a woman um, heading a company? And I know you've been around for a long time. So is I it have. getting better or is it getting harder? Well, you know, there's so many um, things that we can talk about in that area. But first of all, I, I just have to acknowledge Katrina Lake. I mean, to have her baby there was, I love that image of her having her baby with her when she rang the bell. And, and congratulations to the team at Benchmark as well. It was a great service, Stitch Fix. Um, 
as a, an entrepreneur, I think of myself as an entrepreneur first, you know, and the fact that I'm female, I'm not like some subclass, you know, of entrepreneur. I have the same challenges as anybody running a company. Um, fundraising in the landscape, um, in general, just with a VR product has its own challenges, you know, whether you're male or female. So I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to secure funding um, it, 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 with a VR value proposition to the venture community. Um, I have been very fortunate in my career that I have been very well supported by the Silicon Valley venture community. Um, uh, I've had good relationships with many firms that have funded companies I've been involved with. Um, they have always you know, for me, the past 10 years considered me as a, a viable CEO candidate for their portfolio companies across multiple firms. So, um, you know, that hasn't been, I haven't had doors shut in my face that I felt because I was um, a female, I, I, mostly because I think my track record has um, uh, helped me. The alignment with that team, that early jammed at team being a part of that management team, I think really helped me maybe blow past a lot of gender based biases that a lot of women have to deal with in any industry. And so whenever I mentor women uh, and, you know, even casually with my friends who ask me for advice, you know, my advice to them is to be very strategic about their career tracks and, and get success under their belt because when someone sees you as someone who can potentially make money for them they don't care whether you're a man or a woman Nanea Nanea right <laughs> yes <Nanea. laughs> you thank you so much Nanea Reeves yeah you're um, welcome so watch her TED talks um, just search them on Google you can follow her on Twitter and thank you so much where, where's the best place for people to follow trip and 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 see what you guys are doing as soon as you um, release your product Absolutely. Um, trip.com, T-R-I-P-P.com. And uh, they can stay in touch with us through our, our newsletter sign up there. You can follow us on uh, Twitter and um, uh, all our social feeds are on our website. And uh, I'm at Nanea on Twitter. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You, You're Nanea. welcome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Right. Wish you all the best. Thank you. All right. Um, so isolation. Loneliness, all, all these kinds of things can have big health consequences, especially uh, for the elderly. Technology can be a great way to bridge the gap of isolation, uh, allowing for things like video chat, shared experiences online. But technology isn't always that easy to figure out, especially for those not familiar with the many complications that come with setting up a device, logging into accounts even, or understanding a user interface or a touch screen when you're not that familiar with it. GrandPad is a tablet product that lowers the barriers for grandparents and the elderly who might otherwise feel overwhelmed by technology's idiosyncrasies. And it was created by Isaac Lean, who joins us right now here on the show. Welcome, Isaac. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks hey, for having me. Yeah, it's it's fantastic to get you on. We're really happy to to have you here. So, give us a little bit of background as to what the why and how how you came up with the idea for GrandPad and that experience because I think it's a it's a cool story kind of leading up to the release. Absolutely. So, like many uh, new companies, this started with a personal need and a personal passion. Um, so, in my family. Um, I have two grandmas who are living. Um, unfortunately, both of my grandfathers have passed away in the last few years. And um, both my grandmas live in small towns in, in Iowa. Um, and I'll use my grandma Marlis as an example. So she lives independently at home, very able-minded, able-bodied, you know, no big health challenges. Um, but she's in Iowa and I'm here in California with my parents. Um, we live here as well. So we found that technology was causing, you know, disconnections in our lives because my grandma, she's a bit hard of hearing. So talking on the phone, um, you know, it was hard for her to understand us um, when we're talking on the phone. We did email on a computer, but she was having challenges with viruses and scammers and getting logged out in her Wi-Fi. Um, so we were really just frustrated because um, me and my dad, who co-founded the company together, we're both uh, technology guys, and we saw that technology was actually hurting the connections within our own family, and we, you know, felt very ashamed of that that our industry didn't have a, a better solution. So what we ended up doing is, you know, thinking about, you know, what is the solution? We look for existing products. We tried standard tablets, standard computers, um, some products targeted for older folks. And we saw that 
they didn't solve the need um, the needs for my grandma holistically. You know, you still had to have Wi-Fi, you still had to set up, you had to do all these things that caused frustration along the way. So we um, we looked at it and said, you know, what would it look like if we were to build something from the ground up for the needs of my grandma? Um, and that's what we ended up doing with Grandpad, and we saw that a product like this actually works for a lot more people than my grandma, and that these issues of social isolation and loneliness um, really expand not just to our family but to millions of people around the world. So it's a it's a tablet form factor. It has a nice little dock. You pop it in there. It kind of turns it into a, kind of a picture, like a picture frame, almost a digital picture frame when it's docked and everything. Um, but what it, what exactly is different on a tablet that's designed with this type of usability in mind? How does that compare to like the traditional consumer tablet? What are some of the considerations you had to had to tackle there? Yeah. So you know, we really looked at it from the ground up from everything just from the moment you first see the product and you get it in the box. We designed GrandPad so that it could be shipped directly to somebody who's in their 90s, 100s. We had a, a woman who was 114 years old use our product. We can ship it directly to them. They can take it out of the box on their own. They can take it, turn it on. They don't need to have any outside help, unlike something like a standard tablet where you have to take it out of the box, log in to Wi-Fi, all these things. So even things like our packaging are very straightforward, um, You know, clear instructions, 800 number on every side of the box, you can open it with one finger. You don't have to cut anything open or anything like that. But once you take it out of the box, um, as you saw when you showed the website, we have a charging cradle. You just plug that charging cradle into the wall, and you set the grand pad right into it, and it will wirelessly charge the device, um, as you see here, and it turns on automatically. We found that even the small buttons um, on a standard tablet were hard to see for someone who might have um, vision issues or have some dexterity challenges. You just set it on the charger, it turns on automatically. When you get the device, it automatically um, is already set up for you. So when my grandma got her grand pad, she puts it in the charger, it turns on, it's set up for her already. Me as the grandson, I can remotely manage everything about it from the web or from my phone. So, and the other important thing about that is how does it connect? We see Wi-Fi is a huge challenge for older, um, for many older people. The majority of people over 75 don't even have Wi-Fi in their home. So we include unlimited LTE with every device. You take it out of the box, it turns on, you're connected nationwide uh, with LTE. So they never have to log into Wi-Fi, never have to have a password. And in many cases now uh, with XLTE, LT is faster than most people's home Wi-Fi. Um, so that means anywhere they are, at home or anywhere else they go, they can effortlessly do a video call with family members and connect to the ones they love. So I had a chance to, to try it out. Uh, you guys sent me a review unit and I just sent back and I, I just, it was amazing. And I got also had a chance to talk to some of your support team, which I think is a big is a big part of it. White glove support is what you call it. And I know when, the person I spoke to said, you know, people who subscribe to this can call every day, once a week. Um, and you have people that are there to help them through. Where, where do you find all these su support people there? They were so helpful and kind. Yeah, so um, I was happy to see the the segment earlier with uh, with Lori from CNN um, in Iowa. So um, my family's from Iowa. Uh, my grandmas both live there. Most of our support team is in the Midwest in Iowa. Um, they're all grandpad employees, U.S. based, and we just find you know the best, most hardworking, um, caring people who love answering the phones and talking to people like my grandma. People who can answer any questions they have, who are very compassionate, and you know have grandmas and, and older people um, of their in their of uh, in their own life who they really care about. So we really have a passion for helping you know people like my grandma. So we love for our users to call us. You can call us anytime if um, you know if you're thinking about getting a grand pad. You can see um, on our website we have the 800 number on every page. Please give us a call. We'll talk you through everything about how it works. And you know we have the most passionate support people you'll ever talk to and we're here to help you with anything uh, that, that you need. Now, maybe some of the users of, of GrandPad wouldn't be wouldn't you know be interested in a few pieces of, of information here, but I'm curious to know what it's what it's running on, what the operating system is underneath and how updates like, you know, security updates or whatever, mm -hmm. how, how it gets kept uh, up to date over time. Yeah. So great question. And, and like you said, to our to our users, the people using it, this usually, you know, they're not usually too concerned with the specs no. and feeds, but, no. um, you know, for for people like us who are really into into the tech, um, we're very um, excited and happy to be partnered with um, Acer. So Acer is an investor and a strategic partner for GrandPad. So uh, as you know, they're one of the, the leading hardware uh, companies for PCs and other devices. So Acer actually built our own custom tablet. So our device is custom to us. We have innovations like um, dual front-facing speakers. So very loud, crisp audio tuned to the, um, the right um, 
uh, frequencies for those affected with hearing loss, um, has LTE built in and some other improvements designed for, for our users. So it's a custom tablet. It's running on the Android platform. However, what we've done is built our own kind of custom image of Android that um, takes away all the extra stuff that yeah. they don't need. You know, there's no swipe down for notification centers. To the user, it's its own operating system, but it's Android behind the scenes. And in terms of um, updates, one of the things that we've seen was a huge frustration point, especially for people with standard uh, technologies with like tablets. For instance, we knew many users when iOS 7 came out with a huge visual redesign to kind of a, a flat uh, design instead of skeuomorphic. It caused a lot of people to, you know, have to relearn how to use their device. So we um, we seamlessly update the device automatically for our users via LTE, so they don't have to ever do anything. So security updates or any any fixes or changes. But when we release new features, we don't have to turn them on for the user. So they we're not going to push new redesigns to people who don't want mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Every new redesign, every new feature is configurable. So someone can keep it if they buy it today. They can stay that way for the rest of the time they're using GrandPad, or they can choose to opt into getting all these updates. Updates. So we make it seamless to the user. It's customizable uh, for them, even the family members. Um, me as a grandson, I can log into our web portal and I can choose what features I want my grandma to have. So as we really re release new things, they can be turned on by the family or by the user if they choose. Why did you choose the size? I mean, that was the one question I had. Like, it's it's rather mm -hmm. small. I mean, for is it is it so that people can easily carry it around? Why why that size and form factor? Yeah, it's a great question. We tested. Um, Bigger sizes, you know, a 10 inch. Um, we tested smaller, more of a phone form factor. And what we learned is a couple things in our testing. Um, these our users, they're actually quite mobile. You know, they're they're going around, they're visiting their family members. They want something they can take with them. So we saw a larger 10 inch tablet or something very big can be bulky and hard to carry around. This device it can fit in someone's purse or coat pocket. So to our users, it's really it's less of a tablet to them. It's more of their personal smart device. It's like their phone. The same way we carry our phone everywhere, our users carry the GrandPad everywhere with them. Also, bigger devices are harder to hold with one hand. So you know, if they're trying to hold with one hand and navigate with the other if maybe you have some um, you know some dexterity challenges holding a big device and navigating with one finger can be quite challenging so this device they can hold it easily they can get it to the right angle users with macular degeneration or other um, visual challenges can hold it right where they can easily see and the portability also makes a huge um, impact for um, a new partnership which we recently announced with Lyft so we've um, introduced a transportation app on GrandPad where the user can request a ride and really easily go anywhere they want it's a very custom uh, uh, simple experience that we've created our own interface for Lyft. And having the GrandPad as a portable device with LTE they can take anywhere enables um, them to use it in a very empowering way versus a bigger standalone computer or bigger tablet where they might not be able to take it with them. Yeah, no kidding. That's awesome. Um, wh what comes next? I mean, maybe maybe this is the next right now and you're focused on this, but uh, do, you have, do you have any plans that you're willing to share as far as like what the next step is for GrandPad? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, our, our goal is to, um, you know, connect millions of people uh, through uh, GrandPad and through technologies that we're able to build. And we want to bridge the gap, the digital divide that is existing right now between generations. So as new products, you know, things like VR, AR, all these things that, that evolve, they'll have great benefits. We want to make sure that they're accessible to, you know, the older folks who may get left out, who are currently left out by a lot of technology. So um, you can definitely expect more partnerships um, like we've done with Lyft, more partnerships from other services people use. We'll bring those to the GrandPad, but in a way that's safe and secure so that anybody can actually use them and, and really love uh, love those services. Nice. I love what you guys are doing. Isaac Lean uh, with GrandPad. Is it grandpad.net if people want to go and find one? Where can they buy one? Yep. Come visit us at grandpad.net. You can call us or live chat us. We're happy to, to talk with you. And um, anyone can try it right now free for 30 days. So give it a try if you think it'll work for someone you love or for yourself. And um, yeah, we'd love to have you as a user. Thank yeah, you. Ends up being a really good time right now because I don't know if you knew this, but there's a holiday at the end mm -hmm. of next month. <laughs> Christmas is coming along. So uh, anyways, Isaac, thank you so much for taking the time thank to talk you. to us today. And Thanks best again. Of luck. Glad, to, glad to join. All right. Bye. Have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, finally, remember that time, that one time that Apple was discovered to have released an update to macOS High Sierra that allowed for those interested in logging into any computer running the OS with a username of root and no password? You remember that? And not only that, it worked remotely. Oh, those were the days <laughs> two days ago. And yesterday, less than 24 hours later, Apple pushed a patch that fixed this incredibly insecure flaw. So if you are running Mac OS High Sierra with version 10.13.1 or 10.13.2 beta, you'll wanna head over to the Mac App Store, 
download the latest update. It's labeled Security Update 2017-001, and you can patch it up because that's pretty bad. You don't want that on your system. You don't want anyone to be able to remotely log into your computer with just the user name of root. Yeah. That's crazy it that was... this happened, but <laughs> Apple hacked it fast. You got to give credit They for fixed that. it fast. And I think they're pushing it to. To, to everyone. Are they? Like, I, okay. I don't think that, I, I thought that I up, did, you know, updated yesterday, but then it made me restart today. So um, okay. it updated me again, I guess maybe, or I didn't finish it that sometimes happens sometimes even i me, sometimes like, oh. i fail even when i get that notification <laughs> yeah. i fail to like go yes now because it's never the right time it's like oh tonight push it to tonight and i've been tonighting for weeks mm -hmm. so don't do that mm -mm. don't follow my example update it now <laughs> that's a good idea yeah that was i mean a lot of people are scratching their heads just like how did that happen apple themselves are also i mean they, they said they're going to uh, look again at their development processes and you know do better next yeah, time. Yeah, that's a biggie. Uh, someone in chat, ScooterX in chat, is saying that the patch does not apply to the beta. You might want to look into that. I missed that uh, that aspect, but definitely you know look it up because the the news is out there now uh, today for you to be able to update, and you'll want to do that. Yeah, and if it if it doesn't work, uh, Leo also had a really good explanation of what to do. Um, if, if you're running the beta, I guess, you know, just go in and create a new password. That is what I also did before the patch came oh, out. You right. go in and yes. you just uh, do a really secure password and yeah, you can do that. And then Renee Ritchie had a different way. You go in, you know, Leo's way was going through in through the terminal and mm -hmm. Renee's was not. So if you're running the beta, that, that would probably work too. Was that on Mac break weekly? Uh, yes. Um, he tweeted it. Leo tweeted it. So just, you know, okay. check his Twitter account. He doesn't tweet very often anymore, sadly. So it's probably close to the top of his Twitter account. Yeah. All right. So check into that. And we hopefully we've given you the information you need to protect yourself. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday starting at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And you can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tnw. And we are putting together a best of show. And for our show, it's going to be the best interviews all year since we're an interview show now. And we've been doing interviews all year on this show and, and the show we used to do. Maybe perhaps you remember it. So I send us. Show. Yeah, I remember it too. We did it every day. <laughs> uh, go to twit.tv slash best of and submit. If there was an interview that you loved, even if it was last week, two weeks ago, submit it. We want to hear from you. Who did, who did you love hearing about? What would you love to see? Or what would you think other people would like to see? Because maybe they missed it and you you want to share. Yeah. And uh, you, if you want to tweet at me, you can also tweet at me the best interviews. If that's easier, if you don't want to fill out the form, you can tweet at me at Megan Maroney. You can email me even, Megan at twit.tv. Oof, man, you're, you're stepping up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just give you my Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. It's at don't Jason email Howell. Him. Don't even, I get so much email. I don't know how you do it, Megan. Uh, you're really good at the Inbox Zero, though, and I'm Jedi. horrible at that. Yeah, Jedi. You, are, you are an email Jedi. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to Josh. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to Jammer B and Colleen and everyone for helping out here in the studio today for this show. And thanks to you for joining us once again for Tech News Weekly. We'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody.